Reading from Arthur W. Pink's The Divine Inspiration of the Bible. Introduction. Christianity is a religion of a book. Christianity is based upon the impregnable rock of Holy Scripture. The starting point of all doctrinal discussion must be the Bible. Upon the foundation of the divine inspiration of the Bible stands or falls the entire edifice of Christian truth. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Psalm 11.3 Surrender the dogma of verbal inspiration, and you're left like a rudderless ship on a stormy sea, at the mercy of every wind that blows. Deny that the Bible is, without any qualification, the very word of God, and you're left without any ultimate standard of measurement and without any supreme authority. It's useless to discuss any doctrine taught by the Bible until you're prepared to acknowledge unreservedly that the Bible is the final court of appeal. Grant that the Bible is a divine revelation and communication of God's own mind and will to men, and you have a fixed starting point from which to advance and make a domain of truth. Grant that the Bible is inerrant and infallible, and you reach the place where study of its contents is both practicable and profitable. It is impossible to overestimate the importance of the doctrine of the divine inspiration of Scripture. This is the strategic center of Christian theology and must be defended at all costs. It is the point at which our satanic enemy is constantly hurling his hellish battalions. Here it was he made his first attack. Here it was he made his first attack. In Eden he asked, Yea, hath God said? And today he is pursuing the same tactics. Throughout the ages, the Bible has been the central object of his assaults. Every available weapon in the devil's arsenal has been employed in his determined and ceaseless efforts to destroy the temple of God's truth. In the first days of the Christian era, the attack of the enemy was made openly, the bonfire being the chief instrument of destruction, but in these last days, the assault is made in a more subtle manner and comes from a more unexpected quarter. The divine origin of the scriptures is now disputed in the name of scholarship and science, and that too by those who profess to be friends and champions of the Bible. Much of the learning and theological activity of the hour are concentrated in the attempt to discredit and destroy the authenticity and authority of God's word, the result being that thousands of nominal Christians are plunged into a sea of doubt. Many of those who are paid to stand in our pulpits and defend the truth of God are now the very ones who are engaged in sowing the seeds of unbelief and destroying the faith of those to whom they minister. But these modern methods will prove no more successful in their efforts to destroy the Bible than did those employed in the opening centuries of the Christian era. As well might the birds attempt to demolish the granite rock of Gibraltar by pecking at it with their beaks. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Psalm 119.89 now the Bible does not fear investigation. Instead of fearing it, the Bible courts and challenges consideration and examination. The more widely it is known, the more closely it is read, the more carefully it is studied, the more unreservedly will it be received as the Word of God. Christians are not a company of enthusiastic fanatics. They're not lovers of myths. Christians aren't anxious to believe a delusion. They do not desire their lives to be molded by an empty superstition. They do not wish to mistake hallucination for inspiration. If they are wrong, they wish to be set right. If they're deceived, they want to be dis if they are deceived, they want to be disillusioned. If they're mistaken, they desire to be corrected. The first question which the thoughtful reader of the Bible has to answer is, what importance and value am I to attach to the contents of the scriptures? Were the writers of the Bible so many fanatics moved by oracular frenzy? Were they merely poetically inspired and intellectually elevated? Or were they, as they claimed to be and as the scriptures affirmed they were, moved by the Holy Ghost to act as the voice of God to a sinful world? Were the writers of the Bible inspired by God in a manner no other men were in any other age of the world? Were they invested and endowed with the power to disclose mysteries and point men upward and onward to that which otherwise would have been an impenetrable future? One can readily appreciate the fact that the answer to those questions is of supreme importance. If the Bible is not inspired in the strictest sense of the word, then it is worthless, for it claims to be God's word. And if its claims are spurious, then its statements are unreliable and its contents are untrustworthy. If, on the other hand, it can be shown to the satisfaction of every impartial inquirer that the Bible is the Word of God, inerrant and infallible, then we have a starting point from which we can advance to the conquest of all truth. A book that claims to be a divine revelation, a claim which, as we shall see, is substantiated by the most convincing credentials, cannot be rejected or even neglected without grave peril to the soul. True wisdom cannot refuse to examine it with care and impartiality, 
If the claims of the Bible be well-founded, then prayerful and diligent study of the Scriptures becomes of paramount importance. They have a claim upon our notice and time which nothing else has. And beside them, everything in this world loses its luster and sinks into utter insignificance. If the Bible be the Word of God, then it is infinitely transcending in value all the writings of men, and in exact ratio to its immeasurable superiority to human productions, such as our responsibility and duty to give it the most reverent and serious consideration. As a divine revelation, the Bible ought to be studied, yet this is the only subject on which human curiosity does not desire information. Into every other sphere man pushes his investigations, but the book of books is neglected, and this not only by the ignorant and illiterate, but by the wise of this world as well. The cultured dilettante will boast of his acquaintance with the sages of Greece and Rome, yet will know little or nothing of Moses and the prophets, Christ and his apostles. But the general neglect of the Bible verifies the scriptures and affords additional proof of their authenticity. The contempt with which the Bible is treated demonstrates that human nature is exactly what God's word represents it to be, fallen and depraved. And it is unmistakable evidence that the carnal mind is enmity against God. If the Bible is the Word of God, if it stands on an infinitely exalted plane all alone, if it immeasurably transcends all the greatest productions of human genius, then we should naturally expect to find that it has unique credentials, that there are internal marks which prove it to be the handiwork of God, that there is conclusive evidence to show that its author is superhuman, divine, that these expectations are realized we shall now endeavor to show that there is no reason whatever for anyone to doubt the divine inspiration of the Scriptures is the purpose of this book and tape to demonstrate. As we examine the natural world, we find innumerable proofs of the existence of a personal Creator, and the same God who has manifested Himself through His works has also revealed His wisdom and will through His Word. The God of creation and the God of written revelation are one, and there are irrefutable arguments to show that the Almighty who made the heavens and the earth is also the author of the Bible. We shall now submit to the critical attention of the reader a few of the lines of demonstration which argue for the divine inspiration of the Bible. Chapter 1. There is a presumption in favor of the Bible. This argument may be simply and tersely stated thus. Man needed a divine revelation which was committed to writing, a revelation couched in human language. God had previously given man a revelation of himself and his created works, which men pleased to term nature. But this revelation was inadequate. Though the creation bears unmistakable testimony to the existence of its creator, and though sufficient is revealed of God through it to render all men without excuse, yet creation does not present a complete unveiling of God's character. Creation reveals God's wisdom and power, but it gives us a very imperfect presentation of His mercy and love. Creation is now under the curse. It is imperfect because it has been marred by sin. Therefore, an imperfect creation cannot be a perfect medium for revealing God. And hence also the testimony of creation is contradictory. In the spring of the year, when nature puts on her loveliest robes and we see the beautiful foliage of the countryside and listen to the happy songs of the birds, we have no difficulty in inferring that a gracious God is ruling over our world. But what of the winter time? When the countryside is desolate and the trees are leafless and forlorn, when a pall of death seems to be resting on everything, when we stood by the seashore and watched the setting sun crimsoning the placid waters on a quiet eve, we had no hesitation in ascribing the picture to the hand of the divine artist. But when we stand upon the same seashore on a stormy night, hear the roaring of the breakers and the howling wind, see the boats battling with the angry waves, and listen to the heart-rending cries of the sailors as they go down into a watery grave, then we're tempted to wonder if, after all, a merciful God is at the helm. As one walks through the Grand Canyon or stands before the Niagara Falls, the hand and power of God seem very evident, but as one witness to the desolations of the San Francisco earthquake or the death-dealing effects of the volcanic eruptions of Mount Vesuvius, he is again perplexed and puzzled. In a word, then, the testimony of nature is conflicting, and, as we have said, this is due to the fact that sin has come in and marred God's handiwork. Creation displays God's natural attributes, but it tells us little or nothing of his moral perfections. Nature knows no forgiveness and shows no mercy. And if we had no other source of information, we should never discover the fact that God pardons sinners. Man, then, needs a written revelation from God. Our limitations and our ignorance reveal our need. Man is in darkness concerning God. 
blot the Bible out of existence, and what should we know about his character, his moral attributes, his attitude toward us, or his demands upon us? As we have seen, nature is but an imperfect medium for revealing God. The ancients had the same nature before them as we have, but what did they discover of his character? Unto what knowledge of the one true God did they attain? The 17th chapter of the Acts answers that question. When the Apostle Paul was in the famous city of Athens, famous for its learning and philosophical culture, he discovered an altar on which were inscribed the words, To the unknown God. The same condition prevails today. Visit those lands which have not been illumined by the light of the Holy Scriptures, and it will be found that their peoples know no more about the character of the living God than did the ancient Egyptians and Babylonians. Man is in darkness concerning himself. From whence am I? What am I? Am I anything more than a reasoning animal? Have I an immortal soul? Or am I nothing more than a sentient being? What is the purpose of my existence? Why am I here in this world at all? What is the end and aim of life? How shall I employ my time and talent? Shall I live only for today? Eat, drink, and be merry? What after death? Do I perish like the beasts of the field? Or is the grave the portal into another world? If so, whither am I bound? Do these questions appear senseless and irrelevant? Annihilate the Scriptures, eliminate all the light they have shed upon these problems, and whither shall we turn for a solution? If the Bible had never been written, how many of these questions could have been satisfactorily answered? A very striking testimony to man's need of a divine revelation was given by the celebrated but skeptical historian Gibbon. He remarked, since, therefore, the most sublime efforts of philosophy can extend no farther than feebly to point out the desire, the hope, or at most the probability of a future state, there is nothing except a divine revelation that can ascertain the existence and describe the condition of the invisible country which is destined to receive the souls of men after their separation from the body. Our experiences reveal our need. There are problems to be faced which our wisdom is capable of sol incapable of solving. There are obstacles in our path which we have no means of surmounting. There are enemies to be met which we are unable to vanquish. We are in dire need of counsel, strength, and courage. There are trials and tribulations which come to us, testing the hearts of the bravest and stoutest, and we need comfort and cheer. There are sorrows and bereavements which crush our spirits, and we need the hope of immortality and resurrection. Our corporate life reveals our need. What is to govern and regulate our dealings one with the other? Shall each do that which is right in his own eyes? That would destroy all law and order. Shall we draw up some moral code, some ethical standard? But who shall fix it? Opinions vary. We need some final court of appeal. If we had no Bible, where should we find it? Man then needs a divine revelation. God is able to supply that need. Therefore, is it not reasonable to suppose that he will do so? Surely God will not mock our ignorance and leave us to grope in the dark if it's harder to believe that the universe had no creator than it is to believe that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, if it is a greater tax upon our faith to suppose that Christianity with all its glorious triumphs is without the divine founder than it is to believe that it rests upon the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, then does it not also make a greater demand upon human credulity to imagine that God would leave mankind without an intelligible communication from himself than it does to believe that the Bible is a revelation from the Creator to his fallen and erring creatures? If there is a personal God, and none but a fool will deny his existence, and if we are the works of him concerning his hands, he surely would not leave us in doubt concerning the great problems which have to do with our temporal, spiritual, and eternal welfare. If an earthly parent advises his sons and daughters in their problems and perplexities, warns them of the perils and pitfalls of life which menace their well-being, counsels them with regard to their daily welfare, and makes known to them his plans and purposes concerning their future, surely it's incredible to suppose that our Heavenly Father would do less for his children? We are often certain as to which is the right course to pursue. We're frequently in doubt as to the real path of duty. We're constantly surrounded by the hosts of wickedness which seek to accomplish our downfall, and we're daily confronted with experiences which make us sad and sorrowful. The wisest among us need guidance which our own wisdom fails to supply. The best of humanity need grace which the human heart is powerless to bestow. The most refined among the sons of men needs deliverance from temptations which he cannot overcome. Will God mock us then in our need? Will God leave us alone in the hour of our weakness? Will God refuse to provide for us a refuge from our enemies? 
Man needs a counselor, a comforter, a deliverer. The very fact that God has a father's regard for his children necessitates that he should give them a written revelation which communicates his mind and will concerning them, and which points them to the one who is willing and able to supply all their need. To sum up the argument, man needs a divine revelation. God is able to supply one. Is it not, therefore, reasonable to suppose he will do so? There is, then, a presumption in favor of the Bible. Is it not more reasonable to believe that he whose name and nature is love shall provide us with a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path than to leave us to grope our way amid the darkness of a fallen and ruined world? Chapter 2. The perennial freshness of the Bible bears witness to its divine inspirer. The full force of the present argument will appeal only to those who are intimately acquainted with the Bible, and the more familiar the reader is with the sacred canon, the more heartily will he endorse the following statements. Just as a knowledge of Latin is necessary in order to understand the technique of a treatise on pathology or physiology, or just as a certain amount of culture and academic learning is an indispensable adjunct to intelligently follow the arguments and apprehend the illustrations in a dissertation on philosophy or psychology, so a first-hand acquaintance with the Bible is necessary to appreciate the fact that its contents never become commonplace. One of the first striking facts which arrests the attention of the student of God's Word is that, like the widow's oil and meal which nourished Elijah, the contents of the Bible are never exhausted. Unlike all other books, the Bible never acquires a sameness. The Bible never diminishes in its power of response to the needy soul which comes to it. Just as a fresh supply of manna was given each day to the Israelites in the wilderness, so the Spirit of God ever breaks anew the bread of life to them who hunger after righteousness. Or, just as the loaves and fishes in the hands of our Lord were more than enough to feed the famished multitude, a surplus still remaining, so the honey and milk of the Word are more than sufficient to satisfy the hunger of every human soul, the supply still remaining undiminished for new generations. Although one may know, word for word, the entire contents of some chapter of Scripture, and although he may have taken the time to ponder thoughtfully every sentence therein, yet on every subsequent occasion, provided one comes to it again in the spirit of humble inquiry, each fresh reading will reveal new gems never seen there before, and new delights will be experienced never met with previously. The most familiar passages will yield as much refreshment at the thousandth perusal as they did at the first. The Bible has been likened to a fountain of living water. The fountain is ever the same, but the water is always fresh. Herein the Bible differs from all other books, sacred or secular. What man has to say can be gathered from his writings at the first readings. Failure to do so indicates that the writer has not succeeded in expressing himself clearly, or else the reader has failed to apprehend his meaning. Man is only able to deal with surface things, hence he cares only about surface appearances. Consequently, whatever man has to say lies upon the surface of his writings, and the capable reader can exhaust them by a single perusal. Not so with the Bible. Although the Bible has been studied more microscopically than any other book, even its very letters have been counted and registered. By many of the keenest intellects for the past two thousand years, though whole libraries of works have been written as commentaries upon its teachings, and although literally millions of sermons have been preached and printed in the attempt to expound every part of Holy Writ, yet its contents have not been exhausted. And in this twentieth century, new discoveries are being made in the Bible every day. The Bible is an inexhaustible mine of wealth. It is the El Dorado of heavenly treasure. It has veins of ore which never give out, and pockets of gold which no pick can empty. Yet, like earthly treasures, the gems of God must be diligently sought if they're to be found. Potatoes lie near the surface of the ground, but diamonds require much laborious digging. So also the precious things of the Word are only revealed to the prayerful, patient, and diligent student. The Bible is like a spring of water which never runs dry. No matter how many may drink from its life-giving stream, and no matter how often they may quench their thirst at its refreshing waters, its flow continues and never fails to satisfy the needs of all who come and take of its perennial springs. The Bible has a whole continent of truth yet to be explored. A learned scholar who died during the present year of grace had read through the Bible no fewer than five hundred times. What other book, ancient or modern, oriental or occidental, could repay even a fiftieth reading? 
How can we account for this marvelous characteristic of the Bible? What explanation can we offer for this startling phenomenon? It is only stating a commonplace axiom when we affirm that what is finite is fathomable. What the mind of man has produced, the mind of man can exhaust. If human mortals had written the Bible, its contents would have been mastered ages ago. In view of the fact that the contents of the Scriptures cannot be exhausted, that they never acquire sameness or staleness to the devout student, and that they always speak with fresh force to the quickened soul that comes to them, is it not apparent that none other than the infinite mind of God could have created such a wonderful book as the Bible? Chapter 3. The unmistakable honesty of the writers of the Bible attests to its heavenly origin. The title of this chapter, The Unmistakable Honesty of the Writers of the Bible, attests to its heavenly origin, suggests a wide field of study, the limits of which we can only now skirt here and there to begin with the writers of the Old Testament. Had the historical parts of the Old Testament been a forgery or the production of uninspired men, their contents would have been very different to what they are. Each of the books were written by a descendant of Abraham, yet nowhere do we find the bravery of the Israelites extolled, and never once are their victories regarded as the outcome of their courage or military genius. On the contrary, success is attributed to the presence of Jehovah, the God of Israel. To this it might be replied, heathen writers have often ascribed the victories of their peoples to the intervention of their gods. <laughs> this is true, yet there is no parallel at all between the two cases. Comparison is impossible. Heathen writers invariably represent their gods as being blindly partial to their friends and whoever their favorites are. When they fail to come out victorious, their defeat is attributed to the opposition of other gods or to a blind and unyielding fate. In contradistinction to this, the defeats of Israel, as much as their victories, are regarded as coming from Jehovah. Their successes were not due to a mere partiality in God, but are uniformly viewed as connected with a careful observance of His commands. And, in like manner, their defeats are portrayed as the outcome of their disobedience and waywardness. If they transgressed His laws, they were defeated and put to shame, even though their God was the Almighty. But we have digressed somewhat. That to which we desire to direct attention is the fact that men who were their own countrymen have chronicled the history of the Israelites, and therein have faithfully recorded their defeats as well as their victories, and have attributed their defeats not to an inexorable fate, nor to bad generalship and military failures, but to the sins of the people and their wickedness against God. Such a God is not the creation of the human mind, and such historians were not actuated by the common principles of human nature. Not only have the Jewish historians recounted the military defeats of their people, but they have also faithfully recorded their many moral backslidings and spiritual declensions. One of the outstanding truths of the Old Testament is that of the unity of God, that God is one, that beside Him there is none else, that all other gods are false gods, and that to pay them homage is to be guilty of the sin of idolatry. Against this sin of idolatry, these Jewish writers cry out repeatedly. They uniformly declare that it is a sin most abhorrent in the sight of heaven. Yet, these same Jewish writers record how again and again their ancestors, contrary to the universal leanings towards ancestral adoration and ancestor worship, and their contemporaries were guilty of this great wickedness. Not only so, but they have pointed out how some of their most famous heroes sinned in this very particular of idolatry, Aaron and the golden calf, Solomon and the later kings being notable examples. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and from Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrificed unto their gods. 1 Kings 11, 7 and 8. Moreover, there is no attempt made to excuse their wrongdoing. Instead, their acts are openly censured and uncompromisingly condemned. As is well known, human historians are inclined to conceal or extenuate the faults of their favorites. A forged history would have clothed friends with every virtue and would not have ventured to mar the effect designed to be produced by uncovering the vices of its most distinguished personages. Here, then, is displayed the uniqueness of Scripture history. Its characters are painted in the colors of truth and nature, but such characters were never sketched by a human pencil. Moses and the other writers must have been written by divine inspiration. The sin of idolatry, while it is the worst of which Israel was guilty, is not the only evil recorded against them. Their whole history is one long story of repeated apostasy from Jehovah their God. 
after they had been emancipated from the bondage of Egypt and had been miraculously delivered from their cruel masters at the Red Sea, they commenced their journeys toward the Promised Land. Between them and their goal lay a march across the wilderness, and here the depravity of their hearts was fully manifested. In spite of the fact that Jehovah, by overthrowing their enemies, had plainly demonstrated that he was their God, yet no sooner was the faith of the Israelites put to the test than their hearts failed them. First their stores of food began to give out, and they feared they would perish from hunger. Trying circumstances had banished the living God from their thoughts. They complained of their lot and murmured against Moses. Yet God did not deal with them after their sins, nor reward them according to their iniquities. In mercy he gave them bread from heaven and furnished them a daily supply of manna. But they soon became dissatisfied with the manna and lusted after the flesh pots of Egypt. Still God dealt with them in grace. Shortly after God's intervention in giving the Israelites food to eat, which ought forever to have closed their murmuring mouths, they pitched in Rephidim where there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, Why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. What was God's response? Did his anger consume them? Did he refuse to bear longer with such a stiff-necked people? No. The Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. Exodus 17. The above incidents were but sadly typical and illustrative of Israel's general conduct. When the spies were sent out to view the promised land, and returned and reported, Ten of them magnified the difficulties which confronted them and advised the people not to attempt an occupation of Canaan. And though the remaining two faithfully reminded the Israelites that the mighty Jehovah could easily overcome all their difficulties, nevertheless the nation listened not but heeded the word of their skeptical advisers. Time after time they provoked Jehovah, and in consequence the whole of that generation perished in the wilderness." When the succeeding generation was grown under the leadership of Joshua, they entered the promised land and, by the aid of God, overthrew many of their enemies and occupied much of their territory. But after the death of Joshua, we read, there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works with which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt, and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them, and bowed themselves unto them, and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, and served Baal and Ashtaroth. Judges 2, 10 through 13. There is no need for us to follow further the fluctuating fortunes of Israel. As is well known, under the period of Judges, their history was a series of returns to the Lord and subsequent departures from Him, repeated deliverances from the hands of their enemies, and then returning unfaithfulness on their part, followed by being again delivered unto their foes. Under the kings it was no better. The very first of their kings perished through his willful disobedience and apostasy. The third king, Solomon, violated God's law and married heathen women who turned his heart unto false gods. Solomon, in turn, was followed by a number of idolatrous rulers, and the path of Israel ran farther and farther away from the Lord, until he delivered them over unto Nebuchadnezzar, who captured their beloved Jerusalem, destroyed their temple, and carried away the people into captivity. In the repeated mention which we have in the Old Testament of Israel's sins, we discover, in light as clear as day, the absolute honesty and candor of those who recorded Israel's history. No attempt whatever is made to conceal their folly, their unbelief, and their wickedness. Instead, the corrupt condition of their hearts is made fully manifest, and this by writers who belong to and were born of the same nation. In the whole realm of literature there is no parallel. The record of Israel's history is absolutely unique. The careful reader would at first conclude that Israel as a nation was more depraved than any other, yet further reflection will show that the inference is a false one, and that the real fact is that the history of Israel has been more faithfully transmitted than that of any other nation. 
We mean the history of Israel as it is recorded in the Holy Scriptures. For in striking contrast thereto, and in exemplification of all that we have said above, it is noteworthy that Josephus passes over in silence whatever appeared unfavorable to his nation. Now, coming to the New Testament, we begin with the character of John the Baptist and the position that he occupied. John the Baptist is presented as a most eminent personage. We are told that his birth was due to the miraculous intervention of God. We learn that he was filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb, Luke 1.15. John the Baptist was himself the subject of Old Testament prediction. The office that he filled was the most honorable which ever fell to the lot of any member of Adam's race. He was the harbinger of the Messiah. He was the one who went before our Lord to prepare His way. He had the honor of baptizing the blessed Redeemer. Now where would human wisdom have placed John the Baptist among the attendants of the Lord Jesus? What position would human wisdom have ascribed to the Baptist? Surely he would have been set forth as the most distinguished among our Lord's followers. Surely human wisdom would have set him at the right hand of the Savior. Yet what do we find? Instead of this, we discover that he had no familiar discourse with the Savior. Instead, we find he was treated with apparent neglect. Instead, we find him represented as occupying the position of a doubter, who, as the result of his imprisonment, was constrained to send a message to his master to inquire whether or not he were the promised Messiah. Had his character been the invention of forgery, nothing would have been heard of this lapse of faith. Indeed, this is so opposed to the dictates of human wisdom that many have been shocked at the thought of ascribing doubts to the eminent forerunner of Christ and have taxed their ingenuity to the utmost to force from the obvious meaning of the record some other and some different signification. But all these ingenuities of human sophistry are dissipated by the reply which our Lord made on the occasion of John's inquiry in Matthew chapter 11, a reply which shows very plainly that the question was asked not for the benefit of his disciples, but because the Baptist's own heart was harassed with doubts. Again, we say that no human mind could have invented the character of John the Baptist, and the faithfulness of his biographers is another proof that the writers of the Bible were actuated by something more and something higher than the principles of human nature. Another striking illustration of our chapter heading one which many writers have pointed out, is the treatment the Son of God received while he tabernacled among men. For two thousand years, Israel's hope had all centered in the advent of their Messiah. The height of every Jewish woman's ambition was that she might be selected of God to have the honor of being the mother of the promised seed. For centuries, every pious Hebrew had looked and longed for the day when he should appear who was to occupy David's throne and rule and reign in righteousness. Yet when he did appear, how was the promised one received? He was despised and rejected of men. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. Those who were his brethren, according to the flesh, hated him without a cause. The very nation which gave him birth, and to which he ministered in infinite grace and blessing, demanded that he should be crucified. The startling thing which we desire to particularly emphasize is that the narrators of this awful tragedy are fellow countrymen of those upon whose heads rested the guilt of its perpetration. It was the Jewish writers who recorded the fearful crime of the Jewish nation against their Messiah, and we say again that in the recording of that crime no attempt whatever is made to palliate or extenuate their wickedness. Instead, it is denounced and condemned in the most uncompromising terms. Israel is openly charged with having taken and with wicked hands slain the Lord of glory. Such an honest and impartial recital of Israel's crowning sin can only be explained on the ground that what these men wrote was inspired of God. One more illustration must suffice. After our Lord's death and resurrection, he commissioned his disciples to go forth carrying from him a message first to his own nation and later to every creature. This message, be it noted, was not a malediction called down upon the heads of his heartless murderers, but a proclamation of grace. It was a message of good news, of glad tidings. Forgiveness was to be preached in his name to all men. How then would human wisdom suppose such a message will be received? It is further to be observed that those who were thus commissioned to carry the gospel to the lost were vested with power to heal the sick and to cast out demons. Surely such a beneficent ministry will meet with a universal welcome. Yet, incredible as it may appear, the apostles of Christ met with no more appreciation than did their master. They, too, were despised and rejected. They, too, were hated and persecuted. They, too, were ill-treated, imprisoned, and put to a shameful death. 
And this not merely from the hands of the bigoted Jews, but from the cultured Greeks and from the democratic and freedom-loving Romans as well. Though these apostles brought blessing, they themselves were cursed. Though they sought to emancipate men from the thraldom of sin and Satan, yet they were themselves captured and thrown into prison. Though they healed the sick and raised the dead, the apostles suffered martyrdom. Surely it is apparent to every impartial mind that the New Testament is no mere human invention, and surely it is evident from the honesty of its writers in so faithfully portraying the enmity of the carnal mind against God that their productions can only be accounted for on the ground that they spake and wrote not of themselves, but as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 2 Peter 1, 21. Chapter 4. The character of the Bible's teachings evidences the divine authorship of the Scriptures. Take its teachings about God Himself. What does the Bible teach us about God? It declares that He is eternal. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalm 90, verse 2. It reveals the fact that God is infinite. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee. 1 Kings 8, 27. Vast as we know the universe to be, it has its bounds, but we must go beyond them to conceive of God. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. Job 11, 7 through 9. It makes mention of his sovereignty. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. It affirms that he is omnipotent. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 32, 27. It intimates that he is omniscient. Great is our Lord, and of great power his understanding is infinite. Psalm 147, 5. It teaches that he is omnipresent. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? saith the Lord, do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord, Jeremiah 23, 24. It declares that he is immutable, the same yesterday and today and forever, Hebrews 13, 8. Yea, that with him is no variableness, neither shadow of turning, James 1, 17. It reveals that he is the judge of all the earth, Genesis 18, 25, and that every one shall yet have to give account of himself to God, Romans 14, 12. It announces that he is inflexibly just in all his dealings, so that he can by no means clear the guilty, Numbers 14, 18, that all will be judged according to their works, Revelation 20, 12, and that they shall reap whatever they have sown, Galatians 6, 7. It reveals the fact that he is absolutely holy, dwelling in light inaccessible, so holy that he is of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity, Habakkuk 1, 13. So holy that even the seraphim have to veil their faces in his presence, Isaiah 6, 2. So holy that the heavens are not clean in his sight, Job 15, 15. So holy that the best of men, when face to face with their maker, have to cry, I abhor myself, Job 42. Woe is me, for I am undone, Isaiah chapter 6. Such a delineation of deity is as far beyond man's conception as the heavens are above the earth. No man and no number of men ever invented such a god as this. Ransack the libraries of the ancient. Examine the musings of the mystic. Study the religions of the heathen, and nothing will be found which can for a moment be compared with the sublime and exalted description of God's character which is furnished by the Bible. The teachings of the Bible about man are unique. Unlike all other books in the world, the Bible condemns man and all his doings. It never eulogizes his wisdom or praises his achievements. On the contrary, it declares that every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Psalm 39.5 Instead of teaching that man is a noble character, evolving heavenwards, it tells him that all his righteousnesses, his best works, are as filthy rags that he is a lost sinner, incapable of bettering his condition, that he is deserving only of hell. 
The picture which the Scriptures give of man is deeply humiliating and entirely different from all which are drawn by human pencils. The Word of God describes the state of the natural man in the following language. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes, Romans 3, 10 through 18. Instead of making Satan the source of all the black crimes of which we are guilty, the Bible declares, for from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile the man. Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23. Such a conception of man so different from man's own ideas and so humiliating to his proud heart never could have emanated from man himself. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9. A concept that never originated in any human mind. The teachings of the Bible about the world are unique. In nothing, perhaps, are the teachings of Scripture and the writings of man at such variance as they are at this point. Using the term as meaning the world system in contradistinction to the earth, what is the direction of man's thoughts concerning the same? Man thinks highly of the world, for he regards it as his world. It is that which his labors have produced, and he looks upon it with satisfaction and pride. He boasts that the world is growing better. He declares that the world is becoming more civilized and more humanized. Man's thoughts upon this subject have been well summarized by the poet in the familiar language. God is in heaven, all's well with the world. But what saith the scriptures? Upon this subject, too, we discover that God's thoughts are very different from ours. The Bible uniformly condemns the world and speaks of it as a thing of evil. We shall not attempt to quote every passage which does this, but shall merely single out a few specimen scriptures. If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. John 15, 18 and 19. This passage teaches that the world hates both Christ and his followers. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, 1 Corinthians 3.19. Certainly no uninspired pen wrote these words. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God, James 4.4. 4. Here again we learn that the world is an evil thing, condemned by God and to be shunned by his children. Love not the world, and neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. 1 John 2, 15, 16. Here we have a definition of the world. It is all that is opposed to the Father, opposed in its principles and philosophy, its maxims and methods, its aims and ambitions, its trend and its end, and the whole world lieth in wickedness, 1 John 5:19. Here we learn why it is that the world hates Christ and his followers, why its wisdom and its foolishness with God, why it is condemned by God and must be shunned by his children. It is under the dominion of that old serpent, the devil whom Scripture specifically denominates the prince of this world. The teachings of the Bible about sin are unique. Man regards sin as a misfortune and ever seeks to minimize the enormity of sin. In these days, sin is referred to as ignorance, uh, as a necessary stage in man's development. By others, sin is looked upon as a mere negation, the opposite of good. 
while Mrs. Mary Baker Patterson Glover Eddy and her followers of so-called Christian science went so far as to deny its existence altogether. But the Bible, unlike every other book, strips man of all excuse and emphasizes his culpability. In the Bible, sin is never palliated or extenuated, but from the first to last the Holy Scriptures insist upon sin's enormity and heinousness. The Word of God declares that sin is very grievous, Genesis 18.20, and that our sins provoke God to anger, 1 Kings 16.2. It speaks of the deceitfulness of sin in Hebrews 3.13 and insists that sin is exceeding sinful, Romans 7.13. It declares that all sin is sin against God in Psalm 51.4 and against His Christ in 1 Corinthians 8.12. The Bible regards our sins as being as scarlet and red like crimson in Isaiah 118. The scriptures declare that sin is more than an act. It is an attitude. It affirms that sin is more than a non-compliance with God's law. It is active rebellion against the one who gave the law. It teaches that sin is lawlessness. 1 John 3, 4, which means that sin is spiritual anarchy, open defiance against the Almighty. Moreover, Scripture singles out no particular class. It condemns all alike. It announces that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that there is none righteous, no, not one, in Romans 3. Did man ever write such an indictment against himself? What human mind ever invented such a description of sin as that discovered in the Bible? Whoever would have imagined that sin was such a vile and dreadful thing in the sight of God that nothing but the precious blood of his own beloved Son could make an atonement for it? The teaching of the Bible about the punishment of sin is unique. A defective view of sin necessarily leads to an inadequate conception of what is due sin. Minimize the gravity and enormity of sin, and you most proportionately reduce the sentence which it deserves. Many are crying out today against the justice of the eternal punishment of sin. They complain that the penalty does not fit the crime. They argue that it is unrighteous for a sinner to suffer eternally in consequence of a short lifespan of wrongdoing. But even in this world, it is not the length of time which it takes to commit the crime which determines the severity of the sentence. Many a man has suffered a life term of imprisonment for a crime which required only a few minutes for its perpetration. Apart, however, from this consideration, eternal punishment is just if sin is looked at from God's viewpoint. But this is just what the majority of men refuse to do. They look at sin and its deserts solely from the human side. One reason why the Bible was written was to correct our ideas and views about sin, to teach us what an unspeakably awful and vile thing it is, to show us sin as God sees sin. For one single sin, Adam and Eve were banished from Eden. For one single sin, Canaan and all his posterity were cursed. For a single sin, Korah and his company went down alive into the pit. For a single sin, Moses was debarred from entering the promised land. For a single sin, Achan and his family were stoned to death. For a single sin, Elisha's servant was smitten with leprosy. For a single sin, Ananias and Sapphira were cut off out of the land of the living. Why? To teach us what an infinite evil it is to revolt against the thrice holy God. We repeat that did men but see the terribleness of sin, did they but see that it was sin that put to a shameful death the Lord of glory, then they would realize that nothing short of eternal punishment would meet the demands which justice has upon sinners. But the great majority of men do not see the meekness nor justice of eternal punishment. On the contrary, they cry out against it. In lands which were not illumined by the Old Testament scriptures where there existed any belief in a future life, it was held that at death the wicked either passed through some temporary suffering for remedial and purifying purgatorial purposes, or else they were annihilated. Even in Christendom, where the Word of God has held a prominent and public place for centuries, the great bulk of the people don't believe in eternal punishment. They argue that God is too merciful and kind to ban one of His own creatures to endless misery. Yet not a few of the Lord's own people are afraid to take the solemn teachings of the Scriptures on this subject at their face value. It is therefore evident that had the Bible been written by uninspired men, had the Bible been a mere human composition... 
The scriptures certainly would not have taught the eternal and conscious torment of all who die out of Christ. The fact that the Bible does so teach is conclusive proof that it was written by men who spake not of themselves, but as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The teachings of God's word upon eternal punishment are as clear and explicit as they are solemn and awful. They declare that the doom of the Christ rejecter is a conscious, never-ending, indescribable torment. The Bible depicts the place of punishment as a realm where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched in Mark 9:48. It speaks of it as a lake of fire and brimstone in Revelation 20:10, where even a drop of water is denied the agonized sufferer in Luke 16:24. It declares that the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever and they have no rest day nor night in Revelation 14:11. It represents the world of the lost as a scene into which penetrates no light the blackness of darkness forever, Jude 13, a doom alleviated by no ray of hope. In short, the portion of the lost will be unbearable, yet it will have to be born, and born forever. What mortal mind conceived of such a fate? Such a conception is too repugnant and repulsive to the human heart to have had its birth on the earth. The teaching of the Bible about salvation from sin is unique. Man's thoughts about salvation, like every other subject which engages his mind, are defective and deficient. Hence the force of the admonition, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, Isaiah 55, 7. In the first place, left to himself, man fails to realize his need of salvation. In the pride of his heart, he imagines that he is sufficient in himself, and through the darkening of his understanding by sin, he fails to comprehend his ruined and lost condition. Like the self-righteous Pharisee, he thanks God that he is not as other men, that he is morally the superior of the savage or the criminal, and refuses to believe that so far as his standing before God is concerned, there is no difference. It is not until the Holy Spirit deals with him that man is constrained to cry, God be merciful to me, a sinner. In the second place, man is ignorant of the way of salvation. Even when man has been brought to the place where he recognizes that he is not prepared to meet God, and that if he died in his present state he would be eternally lost, even then he has no right conception of the remedy. Being ignorant of God's righteousness, he goes about to establish his own righteousness. He supposes that he must make some personal reparation for his past wrongdoings, that he must work for his salvation, do something to merit the esteem of God, and thus win heaven as a reward. The highest concept of man's mind is that of merit. To him, salvation is a wage to be earned, a crown to be coveted, a prize to be won. The proof of this is to be seen in the fact that even when pardon and life are presented as a free gift, the universal tendency at first is to regard it as being too good to be true. Yet such is the plain teaching of God's word, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And again, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. Titus 3, 5. If it is true that man left to himself would never have fully realized his need of salvation and would never have discovered that it was by grace through faith and not of works, how much less would the human mind have been capable of rising to the level of what God's Word teaches about the nature of salvation and the glorious and marvelous destiny of the saved? Who would have thought that the Maker and Ruler of the universe should lay hold of poor, fallen, depraved men and women, and lifting them out of the miry clay should make them his own sons and daughters, and should seat them at his own table? Who would ever have suggested that those who deserve naught but everlasting shame and contempt should be made heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ? Who would have dreamed that beggars should be lifted from the dunghill of sin and made to sit together with Christ in heavenly places.